Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Hello, I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rask. And you're listening to the Australian Finance Podcast. A podcast where we talk about money, finance, investing, and all that good stuff. We're helping you invest your time and money better one podcast episode at a time. Yes, so please subscribe if you like the series. And don't forget you can find us on social media. We're on all the platforms. Kate, where can people go? You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Rask Australia. That's R-A-S-K Australia. Mm -hmm. And I'm Owen Rask on Twitter. Or Owen Rask AU on Instagram. Beware the imitators. People like to copy us. Without further ado, let's jump in to today's episode. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Fine Arts Podcast. How are you going? I am doing very well, Owen. Yes, it is always a bit of fun. We are talking top five Australian shares ETFs for 2023. We could probably say 2022 as well because they were probably the top five then as well. But hey, headlines. 2023, if you are interested in investing, if you are interested in ETFs, this is the episode for you. It's got all the noise and all the signal that you want. So stay tuned for this episode. We're going to cover the top five Australian shares ETFs. Yes. So says it on the tin, Kate. Um, We've done episodes where we've dived deep into ETFs before. We've dived deep into shares. We did an ETF mini series. So much that we've done on this topic before. So- Why do we want to talk about this? We are going to talk about this because a lot of investors don't know where to start when it comes to building their portfolio. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. in our mini series, we introduced you to, which we'll link in the show notes, how to actually go about researching and comparing and picking ETFs. And since many many of us do have an allocation to Australian companies in our core portfolio, so we want to invest in Australian businesses, I think most of us do. Like, when you say allocation, what do you mean? You need to break down that jar. Oh, wow. It means part of my portfolio, Yep. one portion of the pie, Yep. I invest in Australian companies. It doesn't mean the whole pie. So I do invest in other companies around okay, the world. I invest okay. in, I have a property, I have some cash, I have some bonds, I have some real estate. So it's not the whole part of my portfolio, but it is one portion. And if you have superannuation, which pretty much everyone listening does, your super fund will put a portion of your super fund into Australian companies. Okay. So if you have $10,000, you might have $3,000 or $4,000 in Australian shares. If you have $100,000, you might have $30,000, et cetera. Um, We... Talk about ETFs because you don't have to pick which Australian shares. You can just get all of them or yeah. close to all of them. So most of these ETFs will have the big banks you know about. They'll have BHP, CBA, have Fortescue, Westpac. CSL, Cochlear, all of those kind of companies. Woolworths, Coles. In them. Yeah, yes. Transurban. All of the big names that you know um, are in there. So we're going to go through the five. They're probably the five biggest uh, ETFs, um, they all do something similar, but there is one that is very unique amongst the group. So yeah. maybe we'll spend a little bit more time on that. But um, with all of these ETFs, you get, if you buy one ETF, so you just buy one of these things in your brokerage account, if it's Comsec, if it's SelfWealth, if it's Perla, if it's whatever you're using, if you buy in one of those, you can just go and find any one of these five. Um, 
Yeah. These are just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So the ones we're going to talk about today, which we introduced you to in the ETF mini series, are the A200 ETF, which is run by BetaShares, and that just each of these ETFs is run by a company and they manage and look after and do all the behind the scenes stuff for this ETF. So yep. uh, it makes it easy for you to buy and sell. All you have to do is pick which one and place an order. Uh, we're going to talk about STW. Which so these is- are the ticker symbols. If you're searching for them online, you can go and search for STW ETF and you'll yep. find it in Google. It's like putting in your airport code. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, flight number, booking yes. reference, all that stuff. Yeah. Booking references change every time, so I feel like Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, flight number. Actually, they do reuse flight numbers. I was thinking no, about that like in Virgin d- the other destination, day. Destination like from Tullamarine to oh, Heathrow. Yeah. So it's like MEL and then you go whatever the one is for Heathrow if it's Cairns, it's CRN, yeah. I think or something like that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so you know where you are, where you're going. Oh, cool. Um, Because you said barcode in another podcast, and I was like, barcodes change on a lot of different things. Yeah, in any case, what Kate and I are talking about is the symbol that identifies the investment. Yes, so we like to keep things short in investing, so everything has an acronym and everything's shortened. So when you're looking up the ETF, you don't have to type in Australian blah, 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 blah. You just type in A200 or SDW. Yep. Cool. So that's run by State Street or Spider S P D R. Yep. That's their acronym. <laughs> yeah, there's another one. Yep. Um the other one we're going to talk about is V A S, which, which is, is the biggest one. Yes. Yes. And that's run by Vanguard, which people may have heard of. Uh, any of the regular listeners definitely know what we're talking about. Yeah. Then there's Monique's favorite. I O Z, which is run by iShares. BlackRock. Yep. So when we say Monique's favorite, it's because it's the first ETF she bought. I don't know if it is still her favorite, but uh, she owns it. Yeah, she's gone. Yep. Not. Yeah, sure. Why not? All of them. Um, so, and then the final one, Kate, which is one that a lot of our, even our regular listeners probably don't know as much about. The final run, oh, final one is run <laughs> by a company called Van Eck, and that is the MVW ETF, which is slightly different from the others we just mentioned because it's got the top 100 companies, but equally weighted. Yeah, so I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But basically, for those of you playing along at home, and this is your first ever Australian finance podcast, and you're thinking WTF is an ETF, an ETF is like a basket. Uh, We described it like a box of favorites. Uh, It's just like you get everything in one. Uh, And it makes investing easy because you don't have to pick which shares to buy. You just get, in some of these cases, you get 100 or 200 shares all in one purchase. And someone behind the scenes or a company behind the scenes goes and buys all those. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and you can start with as little as $500. So if you are investing through a broker, most of them ask that you have $500 minimum and you make the purchase. You just buy and sell it like you normally would. But ETFs are primarily designed for long-term investing. So, okay, maybe before we get into the exact numbers here, um, and we will have a table in the show notes as at the date of recording or thereabouts, you know, um, some of these numbers will change by the time this goes to air. So, we just use them as illustrative examples only. Please refer to the ETF provider's website and read their product disclosure statement or PDS before you do anything. And as always, seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial planner before you act on this information. But Kate, Why, let's just start with why would you be looking to invest in Australian shares? Like, what do you get from it? Do you get growth? Do you get dividends? Do you get, like, what do you get? Well, you get a bit of both. So, when you're investing in Australian shares, you're firstly hoping that the businesses grow and develop, they create new products, they get new Mm -hmm. customers, they add more employees, and over the next 10 or 20 years, most of the companies in your ETF will grow. Yeah, right. Some might shrivel up and die, some might stagnate, but you're hoping that quite a few will grow. And that means the overall basket in your ETF will go up in value. So it's like if you had 100 shares inside the ETF, some of them maybe fall away over time, some of them grow, uh, and then the ones that fall away are replaced by new ones that grow. And so eventually over time, the basket may change, but overall they should go up. Yeah, Like when I buy my outdoor, indoor plants, some of them succeed. I brought a whole range of different plants. Some of them look okay. They're kind of like half alive and some of them die. Yeah. And so the hope is by buying a range of different companies, you'll get- get them all in one big basket. You won't have complete success, but you won't have complete failure. So that's why this, that's the difference between stock picking, buying individual stocks and buying an ETF. Okay. So we're going. And, or you so, mentioned dividends as well. Oh yeah, dividends. So yeah, Australian, large Australian companies will o- often pay 
part of the profits each year to the shareholders. So if you own mm-hmm. a share of CBA and CBA mm-hmm. makes money, they will pass some of that money back to you as the shareholder because just owning one share of CBA means you're a shareholder of that company and you own part of the pie. It's a very big pie, yep. but you own a tiny sliver of it. And so if you own an Australian ETF, you get to benefit from all of the companies in that ETF paying part of their profits to shareholders as dividends, but the ETF provider like BetaShares and State Street collect all of those dividends together and they pay you your portion as a distribution. So CBA pays a dividend because CBA shares are owned by the ETF. The ETF, which you own, sends that back to you because you're the rightful owner. Yeah. Makes sense. But instead of 200 little dividends coming through the year, they collect it and you'll usually have two to four distributions each year from being an owner of one of these ETFs. So you get growth over the long term, like 10 years is what we're saying, and you get dividends. Over a 10-year period, the stock market in Australia has returned somewhere between 7 and 10% per annum. But when we say that, it can go down 10, 20, 30% in one year and then up 10 or 20% the next year. But typically what you see is a range, you know, where it just slowly, steadily over time goes up with some big bumps along the way. Yes. So we're not investing in ETS for any of our short to medium term goals. This is something we're doing for a 5, 10, 20 year time period. Yep. So I will maybe, if you let me, Kate, I'll just explain um, some differences here as well as some similarities. Yep. So the STW ETF, which is from State Street slash Spider, depending on how you read it, the A200 ETF, which is from BetaShares, and the IOZ ETF from iShares all do basically the same thing. They all invest in the top 200 companies. So the BetaShares one uses an index, which is just what it tracks which is the top 200 companies by Selective. Um, STW and IOZ basically do the same thing because they follow uh, an index created by Standard and & Poor's and ASX, which is the top 200. So they basically do the exact same thing. That's why when you look down the bottom and you see in the holdings on their website, you can see that BHP, CSL, and CBA are the three biggest positions. They're the same across all three of those. Vanguard is a little bit different because instead of tracking the 200, it tracks the top 300. So meaning you get an extra 100 shares in there. But here's the thing. Those extra 300 shares, they're not that big of a part of the portfolio. Like it's you get the extra 100, but they're the smallest part of the 300. So they're like the smaller ones. Um, so it's not as, yeah, I guess it, it doesn't have as big of an impact. Um, but still, the biggest holdings are BHP, CBA, and CSL. So as you can see, even though it has 300 companies, the biggest companies are still the biggest in the inside the portfolio. Now, where it gets different is the final ETF, which is MVW. And it's not one that we talk about a lot because it's used by financial advisors a lot, like a lot, a lot. But it's not used by individual investors as much. And I think it's because most people don't truly understand what it does. So this one has around about 100 companies in it, give or take. Now, what this does is instead of saying, well, BHP, CSL, and Commonwealth Bank, you guys are the biggest. You guys have the biggest size, which we call market cap, which is the total value of all shares. Um, You guys are the biggest, so you guys get the biggest part of the ETF. You can be like 5 or 10 or 20%, whatever it is, right? And then all the little companies, you guys can be down the bottom as like 0.5% of the ETF. Well, with MVW, it says, no, here are 100 companies. We're going to weight them all exactly the same. 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%. And so they all get the same. And Kate, do you want to explain why the ETF would do that? Why would it say, no, we're not going to give the biggest companies the biggest slice. We're going to try and keep it all even or equally weighted, as we call it. Do you know why we would do that? Well, we've talked about on the podcast before how BHP ends up being about 10% of your ASX 200 ETF in the case of the others. And so suddenly $10 in your $100 investment is weighted towards BHP. So the MVW ETF is different in the fact that it's, I guess, more diversified in the fact that you're not suddenly weighting 10% to BHP. It's probably in there as close to 1%. I can have a look. Yeah, it is. So it's actually 1.3%. Yeah. So, and and that's because there's just under 100 holdings. There's 86 holdings. Uh, as at November 30th, that's the, the data that's still on the website for some reason. Um, that's the data that's there. 
Um, so, everything is like between one and one and a half percent, so maybe a little bit less than one percent if it's fallen since they last rebalanced it. So, what they do is all of these ETFs, but particularly with this one MVW, is it rebalances. What that means is like it just gets the top 100 and then says, oh no, we've got too much of BHP. We're going to rebalance that. Oh no, we've got too much of CBL. A CBA. We're going to rebalance that and we're going to sell a little bit and then put it back in balance. That's all that means. Um, and that's to try and keep the balance. And the reason that we do this, to Kate's point, is maybe you don't want all of your money exposed to BHP, CBA and CSL. Maybe you want less, you still want some of that, but you want less of that. And you want more of the technology companies or the gold mining companies or the energy companies that are further down. They're not quite as big as the biggest bank in the country, for example. And so that's why financial advisors use it because they think, well, it probably makes sense. My clients probably already have some bank shares or they probably already have a property. So we don't want too much exposed to banking. So what we'll do is we'll use this equal weight one, which kind of neutralizes a little bit of it. Now that the problem with this is, is that it almost all, it almost it equals cancels out to be the same type of exposure. So that, what I mean by that is one of the reasons that people will use this is to say, I don't want as much banking in my portfolio. But it turns out that even if you equal weight, even if you reduce the weights of everything and you spread it out, you still get <laughs> a similar exposure to the banking sector mm. because there are so many banking companies and financial companies in Australia. Yeah. And it also, this comp- investing in MVW does reduce your distribution yield a bit because it's not driven as much by the big banks and BHP that pay quite large dividends every year. Yeah. So, can you, what, can you just define that term, distribution yield? Yeah, so if you've invested $100, say, in the IOZ ETF and it has a distribution yield of 6%, that means you might receive around $6 in your bank account each year, but that will be split between about four different payments. Yeah, because it pays its uh, distributions quarterly. So it's just basically saying, what can you expect in income returns versus the growth? So Mm -hmm. keeping in mind that if an ETF has more paid back to you as a dividend or a distribution as it's called, it probably you should probably either reinvest that or it's probably not going to grow as fast because it's paying more back to you. So if we think about, say, if you got a, a 9% return from an investment and it's paid you 6%, it means it only went up 3% because that's the difference. So it's important when we talk about ETFs to consider the total return, the overall return, not just the yield, not just the growth in the share price, but both of them together. And that's in particularly important for Australian ETFs or Australian shares ETFs because the dividends are really important. They're a big part of the return that you get. So, Kate, of these ETFs, which one is the biggest? The biggest one is the VAS mm-hmm. ETF by Vanguard. So, that's over $12 billion of funds. So, investors like you, me, your super fund, your institutional big investors – have invested over $12 billion into that ETF. Mm. And then uh, over time, or just over the last little while, we w- we'll try not to be too specific with the numbers because they do change quite regularly. Uh, which one has performed well or which few have performed well? Yeah, so, I mean, this number's a bit tricky because I was picking the since inception numbers and they all started at very different times. Yeah, right, okay. There's a, a huge array of different times and when the ETF launched launched, uh, matters when you're looking at that since inception number. So I really should have looked at five or 10 years, but they didn't all have the same track record. Um, So, But just roughly, I guess, to give people a sense of like what is likely over the long, long term. Yeah. So they've all performed somewhere between eight to nine and a half percent since inception Mm. for them. Okay. So that's pretty good. And so people, if this is your first instance uh, of ETFs, what it basically means is that uh, investing in Australian shares is higher risk, as we know, but also you would expect a return that's higher than, say, in putting in a bank account or something like that. And you can see that here. Now, the key things for those of you that have already done this, and it sounds a bit repetitious, I'll add a little bit more context to these ETFs. So, with the A200, STW, and IOZ ETFs, they just invest in the top 200. What you're going to get with that is you're going to get the same performance because they basically have the same fees. Uh, A200 will take 0.07%, which is tiny, and it take, I believe it takes it out daily, so you wouldn't even notice it. Uh, that's already reflected in the share price you see in your brokerage account or in Google. 
STW charges 0.13%, again, tiny. IOZ, Monique, charges 0.09%, tiny. Uh, and the Vanguard one, which is the biggest one you mentioned, Kate, that is 0.1%. Now, the only difference between these is basically what, what, are you getting so with Vanguard it's VAS the 300 which are 300 companies you get the extra 100 now that what it might do the purpose of making it 300 not 200k is actually that by doing so you will get a bit more growth out of those smaller two to 300 ranged companies so like the smaller companies that could still grow a bit whereas say CBA is already big right uh, so you might get a little bit more growth from those but what you will also get is you'll get more volatility because those are riskier companies. So you'll see it bounce up and down a bit more than, say, the others. And we're only talking about like 1% or 2% difference over time, right? But the key distinction, the key difference is with the Van Eck one, MVW. Because this one is only about 100, less a few companies, um, it also has higher fees because Van Eck thinks, well, this is unique. We can charge a little bit more. So this is 0.35%. In other words... It's about 3.5 times the price in fees of the VAS ETF. Now, I've actually brought this up on a separate screen for me, but the, the, the MVW ETF over the last five years in total return, so that's the, the yield or the, the distribution plus the growth is 7.8%. Now, that's a pretty respectable return because when you think about it, 7.8% over the last five years is quite strong, mm. um, considering that we've had a bit of volatility and we've had all these things. But what you could expect, in my opinion, from that is you could expect more volatility, more ups and downs, because what happens is you have, even though it's equally spread out amongst the companies or your money, what you have is you still have a fair bit, a few more smaller companies. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, what you're doing with an equally weighting is you're taking money from the biggest companies and you're rearranging that by putting it in the smaller companies. So if the smaller companies are more risky, because they're a bigger part of your portfolio all of a sudden, relatively speaking, you're going to get more ups and downs or volatility. Now, I've got the same returns for the VAS ETF, which is 8.22%. So 8.22% versus 7.8% over the same period. So... You can see that's probably the difference between the fees, to be honest. Mm. So the one of the big outcomes here for you is when you think about selecting an ETF is fees matter. Because they compound over time like returns do. Yeah. So if you've got 0.35% versus 0.1% one year, that's like a difference of 0.25%. Well, that's this year and the next year and the next year and the next year. Yeah. But, There's actually a good money smart calculator that shows you it's all about yeah, fees right. yeah. and it shows shows you you had exactly the same $1,000 in very mm. similar ETFs that pretty much do the same thing except have different fees. And yeah. if one has this fee and one has a much higher fee, it's not noticeable maybe in year one as much, but as you go on to 20 years, 30 years, the gap between the performance, yeah. the end result that you have in your portfolio between the two funds widens exponentially. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make sure that that's in the show notes. I just yeah. found it, the managed funds fee calculator. Yeah, because yeah. it tries to manage funds, which we don't talk about as often on the podcast, they're a little bit different, but they often have higher fees. We're talking above 1% per year. Yeah. And so if 1% versus 2% has a much bigger difference over a long period of time. So yeah. uh, ASIC's Money Smart website tries to uh, show you that difference. Yeah. So um, what we always say or what we there's a general rule is that we're not against fees. Like People deserve to be paid. Finance companies deserve to be paid just like anyone else does. But what we need to be sure of is we need to understand the impact of fees. And we've got to a point now with our industry where ETFs offer really low fees, like each of these ETFs, even 0.35%. I would happily invest in the MVW ETF. I don't want to knock that. I would happily invest in it in the right at the right time. Do I think, do I have a preference for VAS over MVW? Yeah, I do, to be honest. There's a reason it's the biggest. But would I could I still own a bit of MVW? Yeah. You could put it alongside it for sure. Do I think it's a replacement? Not for me. I like VAS. I like the big one. Um, I like the big one. Um, whereas you, you've got to also consider when it comes to these uh, ETFs is you've got to consider like where are fees going over time? And for the most part, all of these funds, with the exception of A200, which has already got the lowest fee, they've been lowering their fees over time. So 
Vanguard is, because it's um, owned by its investors, it's not owned by a for-profit company, um, it keeps lowering its fees. And so that's why a lot of people like it too, because they're saying, well, it might not be the cheapest right now, but in 20 years when I'm still owning it, it might be. And, and that's when I'll have the bigger amount of money, the lower fees make more sense. So, you know, a lot of people would come into this podcast thinking, Kate, well, you know, which one should I go with? And the answer is, Go and follow the, the steps that we laid out in the ETF mini series. Super easy. We went through all of them basically, but pr primarily like one of them and we did it side by side with the US one. Uh, you could start with any of these, to be honest. Like it's, if you just start with the smallest amount of money in any, any of them and to see what you get a feel for, go and research them, go and check it out. Um, do you own any of them? I own STW. Ooh, STW. So I own VAS now. I did own A200, but it was actually a mistake. I didn't mean to sell it, but my automation inside Pearl automatically sold it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I own VAS now. And Monique owns IOZ. Look at us all being very different. Isn't that cute? Um, I think it goes to show yeah. this. Like, MVW is a bit different, but between the other four, they all do very similar things. They hold, they fill a very similar role in your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, they do. And like, there have, it's actually interesting that over the last um, over the last five years, I don't think VAS has been the most the best performing. If I just bring this up, because when you compare an ETF, by the way, you want to compare it over exactly the same time frame, because what you'll get is you'll get like a comp you're comparing apples to apples. So yeah, so I'm, you have to look in the fine print, and when it says this performance is as of. 30th that. of November or 30th of December or whenever it is. So the total return of the STW ETF, which is your one, Kate, is 8.11%. Vanguard was 8.22, which is- We're um, talking about five years here now. Five years, yeah. And the Van Eck one was 7.8. So to be honest, we talk about like fees make a big difference. It's not that big of a difference. Mm. Yeah. But um, so this is where we say like you can't- like, you're not going to go too wrong with any of these things. We don't really talk about things you can go too wrong with, to be honest. But, um, you know, go and research these. Jump on their websites. Have a look around. See what's included. See, you know, maybe jump online. See what the reviews are. We give, we obviously help people pick ETFs inside our RAS Core membership, which is just $9.99 a month. If you're interested in seeing exactly what we recommend and why, uh, it's, you can just get it for a month. And if you don't like it, just give it up. But, um yeah, I mean, all of these are great, and I would happily start with one of these ETFs. If I was brand new to investing, I would buy a t the smallest amount that I could possibly buy, hold on to it for three or four or five months while I learn about investing, on the show, of course, and then from there, maybe look at expanding out. But that's about it, Kate. I don't, yeah. I don't know if there's anything we've missed. No, I think this was just uh, sort of to summarize what we did in our what, five or six part. ETF mini series last year, which if you're new to the podcast, that is a fantastic place to start if you want to learn about ETFs because we really break down all the terminology. We bring mm. chocolates into the studio. So Good videos. Yeah. yeah <laughs> explain how it all works. And there's a an activity um, where you can actually go and research all this stuff for yourself that I'll link in the show notes. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. If you are new to the Australian Finance Podcast, Welcome. Welcome to the show. We're normally a bit more lighthearted and a bit more like jokey. This one's serious. We're talking about investing. Um, but honestly, just get started. There are 250 ETFs now in Australia. If you sit there and stare at them all long enough, you'll probably fall asleep before you make a decision. So just go and get the smallest amount of money and just see what happens. You'll be able to recover. Um, and if you're in doubt, watch our mini series or join us inside Rascore, uh, where you'll get even more education and you get a bunch of free courses to go along with it. You can take our, we've got heaps of free courses on Rask education, uh, but if you're a member, you get an extra five or 10. So um, check it out. Kate, this is awesome. Australian shares. We love it. Uh, we're both invested. Monique's invested. It's good fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. 
Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.